continue to say, go ahead and, and remember Brother Dylan's ministry at the coffee shop and Bible study going on there. Um, let's remember that in prayer. Um, also, uh, let's just remember not just greater hope, but I mean, the day and time that we live in, we, we really need to be in earnest prayer about the church just as a whole. Um, not just our church, but of course we do need to remember each other in prayer and pray for our local assembly, but let's just pray for the church in general, man. I mean, if, if y'all aren't paying attention, there's a lot of stuff going on. And uh, whether you want to believe it or not, I mean, the church of God is under attack on every level. It's not something that um, that we honestly need to take lightly. It's something that we need to take serious in our prayers and, and really pray for the local assembly. I mean, we do live in the church ages of Laodicea. And uh, man, if you, don't, if you don't understand what that means, it's a very serious, very serious deal. Once you get in the Word of God and you start understanding what that actually means, where the church is as a whole, I'm telling you, bro, I'm brother doing a scary thing. I mean, we're, the, the church is, uh, man, it's the old gray mare. She ain't what she used to be. I mean, by no means am I comparing the church to an old gray mare, but I'm just saying, I mean, you know, this, this is not the Philadelphia church age. I mean, let's be honest. So let's definitely continue to remember the church as a whole. Let's remember our local assembly, continue to pray for our pastor and his family. And, uh, has anyone heard anything from Brother Sean, how his foot's doing, how he's healing up, the, the progress on that? Okay. Okay. Well, let's just remember to pray for Brother Sean and his, uh, his foot, um, where he had the surgery on that, and uh, pray that God will get him back up and going. I miss seeing him in here on a regular basis. And uh, I've been through some surgeries, and if you've been through a surgery, you know that, well, it's a lot of fun, ain't it? So <laughs> let's just continue to pray for Brother Sean. And uh, let's just go ahead, and, and while we're here tonight, before we get started, let's just go ahead, and if you would, bow your heads with us in a word of prayer. And uh, we're just going to go to the throne now and just ask God to bless this service, bless this place. So if you would, bow your heads with us. Father, we come to you tonight, and God, we're just so humbled to be in your presence one more time. God, we're thankful for this place of worship that you blessed us with, God, that we can come together and unite as a local assembly. Lord, gathering in your name to worship you. God, we just pray, uh, Lord, for Brother Sean tonight. God, I ask that you'd continue to heal him, and Lord, get him back up and going. Father, I just pray that you'd uh, touch him where he's at tonight. God, let him know that we, we love him and we're thinking about him and praying for him tonight. God, we just ask that you'd continue to bless our uh, pastor and his home, his family. God, pray that you'd protect him from the attacks of, of the wicked one, God, from Satan himself, Lord, that would do everything he can to tear the man of God down. And Father, I just pray a hedge of protection around him tonight. God, I ask that you'd be with him spiritually and mentally and physically, God, that you'd keep his family healthy. Lord, we pray for the health of Greater Hope Baptist Church. Uh, Lord, you've been with us so far, keeping folks healthy, and uh, God, I just pray that you'd continue to do that, and Father, we thank you for it. God, tonight we pray, Lord, for the church as a whole, and God, we just ask that you'd help us in these last days, God, as we draw near to the end times, and Father, that you're, you're coming back to get us. God, we just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be witnesses for you, Lord, that we'd be strong and courageous during these last days. And God, just point towards the cross to all that we come in contact with. God, I pray that we would bring honor and glory to your name in all that's done. Father, we pray tonight, Lord, that you would bless in a mighty way. Father, that you'd be in this place. God, you've prepared a feast for us here. And as we sit down at your table, God, we just pray that each one of us would take liberally from what, for what you have for us. God, we ask that you'd bless the service. Lord, bless what's being said tonight. May it all be done for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you got your Bibles, turn with us to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 15. Um, if you go over in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15, this is, uh, we're going to say it's kind of a familiar verse of Scripture in the Bible, and you say, well, this is in the Old Testament, and you're right, it is. Uh, but I'm telling you, there's a valuable lesson to be learned from this portion of Scripture. Um, 
this is something that, that honestly we're going to read quite a bit here. Um, but it's to prove a, a very valid point. You know, I've said that during these last days that uh, the church age in which we exist and, and the, that we live in is the Laodicean church age. I mean, you know, I have need of nothing. We, we think we've got it all figured out. And uh, friend, honestly, we don't have it all figured out. I mean, we, we really need to come to the place where, um, you know, we, we need to come to an understanding. Amen. How about that? We need to come to an understanding of where we are um, as a church. We need to come to an understanding of where we are as Christians. And until you get to the point where you know where you are, you have no idea where you're going to go. All right. I mean, if you don't know where your starting place is, how are you going to know where you're headed? You have to know where you're at right now to know where you're going. And uh, I want to just tonight, I want to talk just a little bit about perception, perception, now get this, perception is reality. You've heard that saying your whole life, perception is reality. How you perceive things is your reality. Can't, it's hard to argue with that logic, right? I mean, we sit and we think about it and we say, well, you know, well, that's how I see it and that's just how it is. And my wife will tell you I'm one of the most stubborn people that you will ever meet. I mean, bless God, I will argue with a stop sign. I, if I think I'm right and I don't think that stop sign should be there, I'm going to argue with it until the sun goes down and I'll see you in the next morning. I'll be back. That's just me. Um, it's one of my faults. My wife cannot stand that about me, and I have to continually apologize about that because that's, that's kind of my nature. I'm just right until you prove me wrong. I don't know if it's a man thing or if it's a Tim thing, but that's me. Um, my perception is my reality on a lot of things, and I think my perception should be your reality too. Right? Because my wife will tell you I'm never wrong, and even if I am, I'm still right. So... Um, when we talk about perception and what that means is, you know, how you perceive something, how you see something apply to your own life. Now, as we look into the Word of God, we're going to see in these few Bible verses here that maybe our perception might be reality, but our perception ain't right. So let's look in here, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. Uh, verse number one, the Bible says, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tel Ahim, 200,000 footmen, 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. Now, so far, Saul's doing a pretty good job of what God told him to do. So far, Saul's right on point. And Saul said, uh, verse number six, and Saul said unto the the Kenites, go depart, get you down from among uh, the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Hivala uh, until thou comest to Shur, that is, over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and of the lambs, and all that was good, that would, that, uh, and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, they destroyed utterly. Now I'm going to read on down a little bit further here. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. 
And when Samuel rose early uh, to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, uh, he set him up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord. Now read what uh, uh, Saul told Samuel here. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now the story we read, I'm just going to summarize it real quick. God told Samuel, go to Saul and said, go down uh, and destroy, just utterly destroy them. Everything, everybody, every beast, doesn't matter, age, man, woman, boy, girl, child, doesn't matter. Everything in the entire town, I want it gone. I don't want any remnants left. Everything is to be utterly destroyed. I want it all gone because that's what I want. Saul said, I got you. Saul goes down, and he kind of had his own perception of what God meant. Saul had his own idea of what the Word of God actually was to him. Saul goes down there, and he, well, instead of killing the king, he takes the king prisoner, brings him back, and says, you know, that's, that's a good-looking ox. I kind of hate to kill that right now. All the stuff that was bad looking, all the, the animals that were uh, debilitated in some way or had some kind of flaw in them, he went ahead and killed them. But all the good stuff, brother, he brought back with him, including the king, Agag himself. And God came to Samuel and he said, you know, I'm kind of bothered right now that Saul done this. Samuel goes and asks Saul, what's going on? What happened to the plan that God set forth? When God spoke this, why didn't you do what God said? Saul's response was, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. I did everything God said do. Kind of. Right? Saul's perception did not match exactly what the Word of God said. But in Saul's mind, he done everything the right way. Saul done everything that Saul thought he was supposed to do except for what God said do. Herein lies the problem with a lot of us today. We want to do what we feel is right instead of what the Word of God says. We want to do what, what feels good to us instead of what the Bible says to do. Now the first thing I want to look at, I mean, I, I want to look at this, when we start talking about perception, the first thing I want to look at is man's perception of God. Because I think this is the first fatal flaw in, in who we are and, and what we do a lot of times. We have a misconception of who God really is. We have a misconception of who He is as a person, of who He is as a Lord, and, and just being our God in general, we have a huge misconception of who He is. I've heard people refer to God as the man upstairs, the big guy, the boss. Whatever other slang term that you've heard people just throw out there, but God is not just a creator who sits by and just, you know, wound everything up and let it go like a top and the earth is just bouncing and spinning and people are just going into it. There's a plan. There was a plan that was set in place and God is still in control. He's a, a, he's a, a, a righteous holy God. He does not just leave us out here wondering about just going and, and doing our own thing without having a plan for our life. But oftentimes, Brother Dylan, I think we just find ourselves just meandering through life and sometimes I kind of feel this way myself that maybe I'm just kind of going and doing my own thing. But see, that's my flaw. That's my mistake because I have a misconception. My perception is all messed up of who God is. My perception is messed up of what God actually is in my life. If we go and we look in John chapter number 4 and verse 24, the Bible says, God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I'm, there's a lot of Bible tonight. There's a lot of Bible verses, and I'm just going to be throwing it at you left and right. 
Because again, I don't ever want you to think that Tim's standing up here just spewing Tim. I want you to know this is Bible. So the first thing is, God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. Well, worship is not something that's just done when you show up at church. I think that's our first misconception. That's where we get our perception wrong of God. Our worship is not something that only we do collectively when we come together at church. But I want you to understand this. Worship is something that's personal. Worship is something between you and God that you have that time where you worship Him on your own. It's not just something where you come in here and Brother Daniel and Sister Kenya sing a song and the choir sounds good and Brother Lee preaches and then we go home and we feel good about ourselves. That's a huge misconception of modern day Christianity that we show up like we purchased a ticket to a show and we sit in the seat, I have paid my dues, entertain me. And we want to sit there and be entertained. That's not who God is. God is a spirit. He wants us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Well, how do we do that? That is a personal thing, but you have to make sure that you have that time of worship with God. You don't need to neglect that. I don't need to neglect that in my life. My perception of God, I need to understand that He desires my worship. He desires my relationship. He wants me to come before Him and exalt Him. So we need to understand first off that He is a spirit and that we need to worship Him in spirit and in truth. The next one I want you to look at of the perception of God is 1 John 4, 8. God is love. He that loveth not knoweth not God. Again, for God is love. Now there are some people who were raised up to think that let me, let me, there are some people who were raised up and were never told one time about the love of God. There are people who were uh, saved, born into a Christian life, born again, and from the time they got saved until, I mean now, even going on right now, uh, brother, they're, they're told that, that God is a righteous judge and basically there's no love ever mentioned. God does not really love them. God's just waiting on them to mess up so he can hit them with a lightning bolt like a sniper from a rooftop. I mean, and they live their life in utter fear of messing up. I'm talking about they, they don't even want to step on a banana peel afraid they might slip and fall and God's going to kill them. Um, there's many stories that could be told, and I'm not going to go into that, but we need to understand that God does not want to kill us. God does not want us to die a slow, miserable, painful death like some people think. That's a misconception. Your perception is wrong. If you perceive God as someone who wants to kill you or harm you or harm your family, your perception of God is wrong, and it needs to be adjusted to the fact that God is love. Now, I'm not up here preaching unicorns and rainbows tonight. God ain't all about love. He is a righteous judge. He is a righteous God. But listen to me, God loves you so much that the very, I mean, just to the very core of God, the fact of who He is, Brother Dylan, is love. The fact that, I mean, John 3, 16 is even in the Bible should tell us alone how much God desires a relationship with us and how much God loves us just based on that simple fact. 1 John 4, 16, right after 4, 8, and we have known and believed uh, the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in, in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. You cannot be a Christian if you don't love. I'm just going to go ahead and say, if you say you're saved and you don't have love, let me tell you something, friend, I would, I would really... And I'm not going to sit here and judge your salvation, but I would say if you don't have any love in your heart and all you have is hatred and all you have is bias and all you have is just this, this turmoil inside you that constantly comes out, I would venture a guess that you have probably been... Um, you've probably fallen into a form of religion, but I'd find it hard to say that it's salvation. Um, these first two sections here I'm going to go through pretty quick because I'm really anxious to get to, to my third point tonight. But 
Not only is God love, but also God is a companion. If we look in Joshua chapter 1, verse 19, God said, Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Oftentimes we forget that because it shows in our daily life that we forget that God is with us. We forget that everywhere we go, there He is. I mean, God is with me just as much throughout the day as I'm with me. And oftentimes we forget that as Christians because I just have a sneaky suspicion that if we didn't forget that, we wouldn't do some of the things we do. We wouldn't say some of the things we say. We wouldn't think some of the thoughts we think. And yet we do because we forget that God's with us. We forget all about that because it's easy sometimes to forget the fact that God is there because we'd rather not because it makes the flesh feel better if He's not. The other thing is God is trustworthy. The psalmist wrote this in Psalm 56, 3, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. I don't know how you are, but sometimes whenever I get frustrated, I was just talking with Brother Dylan before church about going to play golf, and I said, you know, sometimes, um, you know, between work and just life and everything, I feel sometimes like my shoulders just kind of get weighed down. I just feel like I'm burdened. I feel like, you know, it's just tearing me up. And I said, sometimes, man, just going out on the golf course, it's, it's just a release even though I'm terrible at golf and it frustrates me so bad because I hit so many bad shots when I play, but yet even going and doing that is just relaxing. It's just my way to blow off steam and it's just, it's so relaxing. And sometimes I sat there and I said, you know, it's kind of embarrassing for me to even say that because I thought about this. God is trustworthy. He's there. He's my friend. He's someone I should be able to talk to and depend on. But my perception is wrong of who God is. I don't perceive Him to be a trustworthy friend like I should. And why is that? We'll get to that shortly. Revelation 1.8, God is eternal. said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Saith the Lord which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I think sometimes we forget that God, I actually remember as a child, um, I kind of had this, this thought today as I was kind of reflecting on this, and I thought, man, you know, as a, as a kid I used to think, I wonder how old God is. <laughs> like he celebrates a birthday every year, you know. The ignorance of a child, right? But I used to wonder these things. But God is eternal, man. I mean, He always has been. He always will be. I mean, that's just something, if you think about that, when we get our perception of God right, everything else starts to fall in place. When we realize how much God loves us, when we realize how much God desires a relationship with us, when we start to understand the fact that God is the creator of the universe, He was here before anything else was, and we start realizing that that person, is the one that desires a relationship with us. He desires our worship. He desires our friendship. Man, it kind of starts making things make sense a little bit. God don't want to kill us. He don't want to torture us. He doesn't want to hang us out to dry and just leave us with nothing. Again, it's not unicorns and rainbows, but we need to understand who God is, and the only way we can do that is by getting in His Word. You're not going to know Him until you actually get in His Word and find Him. Next, I want to look at God's perception of man. We've looked at man's perception of God. Now I want to look at God's perception of man. Genesis 1.27, we know this. It said, God created man in His own image. In the image of God created He Him. Male and female created He them. God created man in His own image. He didn't just want some beast, some little thing crawling up out of the water and evolving millions of years later into something that was dragging its knuckles and then later learned to walk upright. You're welcome to believe that if you want to, but again, you're the stop sign and I'll argue with you all day. Um... John 3, 16, God's perception of man is this, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we say that verse so flippantly sometimes because we've heard it our whole lives 
even being raised in a heathen home, I remember seeing John 3.16 on TV at the football games when the guy at the end of the end zone always held the sign up, John 3.16. I always remember seeing that. And, uh, you know, I got saved when I was 21 years old. I'm 44 now, and I've, I, we've all heard that verse. And sometimes we just say it without really considering the power in that verse of Scripture. When we really think about what God is saying there that, you know what, he, he became flesh, dwelt among us to deal with the things that we deal with and then crucify that on the cross and die, be buried in a borrowed grave only to raise again on the third day and ascend up into heaven to sit down at the right hand of God the Father and make intercession for you and I. We forget about these things to the point where it just becomes so nonchalant in our daily life that we just, man, we don't understand the weight in John 3.16 anymore. It has become old hat to so many Christians that we forget about God's perception of man. Romans 5.8, God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We need to understand God's perception of man, that God wants and desires that relationship. He wants that relationship. Our sin separated us from Him, and He made a way for us to get back to Him. He made a way to restore that relationship back to Himself because He desires that relationship with us. If we could get our heads wrapped around the fact that God loves us and God desires that relationship, it would make a huge difference in our Christian walk, in our daily lives. If we could understand 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew Him not. If we could understand that we become the sons of God. Man, what is it like to know that it's not just Jesus is the Son of God, but He also said that He would make us an heir, and not just an heir, but a joint heir. How about that? A joint heir with Christ. We forget about that because as Christians, it's not on our radar to think about how God really perceives us, how God looks at us. God desires that relationship. He desires our worship. He desires those things. We just walk away like it don't matter. i got more important things to do. I've got so much other things going on that I just don't have time for all that. Galatians 3.26 for y'all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. We can look at Romans 8. 14 through 17, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We forget about these things. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. How is it as Christians we so easily forget these words? How is it that we walk around in our daily life and we really don't even understand the God that we claim to worship and how He looks at us? How He perceives us? Romans 8, 38 and 39, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can, I mean, these are just a few of the verses I pulled from the Bible just for tonight. The Bible is full of God's love towards man and restoring that relationship. And we need to get that perception straightened out of God's, how God looks at man. And we need to understand these things. If you don't understand it, you are missing out on so much. So much. I, I've spent so much of my Christian life not understanding these things, not fully grasping the fact that God does love me. I was one of those people that walked around sometimes thinking, well, God's going to be so mad at me and God's, He's just going to hate me. I mean, man, you talk about a weight that you carry that you don't have to... That is a burden that no person should bear, thinking that, that God's walking around with crosshairs on you your whole life. I mean, man, we, we have got to get 
get our, our heads wrapped around this aspect of our perception of God and God's perception of man. And until we get that figured out, man, it's, you, are, you are losing out on so much. Losing out on so much. Now to the third thing tonight. We've looked at our perception of God. We've looked at God's perception of man. Now this one is going to be interesting. Because this is our perception of God's Word. The very first thing that you need to do is you have to approach God's Word in faith. If you do not come to God's Word in faith, you're never going to get it. It's never going to mean anything to you because you're going to spend your entire life, what if it's wrong? What if it's wrong? What if it doesn't mean anything? I wonder if it's right. Of course it's right. It's never been proven wrong. It's been around for thousands of years. Since God first spoke, it, spoke this world into existence, God's Word has been around. It's never been proven wrong. There's no fault in it. There's never been one single fault in this entire book that anyone has ever been able to find or point out. Not to my knowledge anyway. We have to approach God's Word with faith. Faith is the very foundation upon what the Christian life is built on. Without faith, what are we? Without faith, it's works. And if it's based on works, friend, we might as well just pack this stuff up and go home because my works ain't going to cut it. <laughs> I'm being honest. My works ain't good enough, brother. My works ain't going to get it. I don't read enough. I don't study enough. I don't pray enough. I don't do enough charity work. I don't give enough. I'm greedy. I'm selfish. I'm hard-headed, stubborn. So if this thing's based on works, man, I might as well just pull my keys out of my pocket, go hop in my old Ford truck and drive back to Villa Rica. I've got no business if it's about works. But this thing's about faith. So when I look at God's Word, I ha I've got no choice but to look at it by faith because I ain't smart enough to figure it out on my own. I just got to trust that God's got this thing because without that, I'm sunk. Hebrews 11.6 says this, But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We have to accept the Word of God by faith. When we look at the Bible, we must accept that faith or accept uh, by faith that it is God's Word, it is inspired, it is holy, it is a perfect Word, it's complete, nothing needs to be added or taken away. Isaiah chapter number 40 and verse 8 said, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the Word of God shall stand forever. This Bible has... Now... Let's not misunderstand when God first spoke in Genesis. He didn't just hand this thing down to Adam and say, here you go. That's not at all how this thing was done. Psalms 12, 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. We need to understand that the Word of God is pure. We need to understand that it's holy, we need to understand that it's eternal. Psalm 119.89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Another place said that I have exalted my word above my name. We need to understand and get a perception of God's word. This is the word of God. This is everything that he ever spoke right here in volumes for us to read. How should we neglect it? But yet we do. We neglect the Word of God to the point where our perception of the Word of God has become so skewed over the years that even, I mean, we really just begin to question, is that really the Bible? 
Is it really? Well, I got news for you, friend. God cannot tell a lie. It's impossible for him to lie. Numbers 23, 19. The Bible says this, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not uh, do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall not make it good? If God said it, it's going to happen. He said he'd preserve this word. Friend, that word has been preserved. Now, I've got a question for you. First, let me get this. Go down to Hebrews chapter 6, 18, Brother Charlie. It says, By two, two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. So now we've established, number one, it's impossible for God to lie. And we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. And go down to that next one, Brother Charlie. Titus uh, chapter 1 and 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God, it's impossible for him to lie. And again, the Bible said that he cannot lie. And yet we sit and we question God's word, whether it's true. How are you going to trust him for salvation? And you want to believe that part of it. But friend, we can't trust the rest of it because, well, we just don't really understand. But see, when it comes to heaven, we're all about that Bible. But when it comes to the Bible being true, well, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it is. Maybe it ain't. I don't know. When we sit and we look at the Word of God, in its entirety, in its current state, it's perfect, it's pure, it's holy, it's infallible, it's perfect in every word, it's complete, it's whole. It's not missing anything other than my eyes and my heart. Because I ain't in it enough. Second Timothy chapter number three, verse sixteen and seventeen. God's word is inspired. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Man, he's given it to us. If there's a calling on your life, and every Christian has a call, I'm just going to be honest with you. If you're a Christian, there's a call on your life to do something. And God has provided the toolbox and the tools in which to complete that call. I mean, he, He's given us everything that we need right here in this holy word to do everything that He requires us to do. Our perception of God's word is what keeps us from doing it. Because... Are we really sold out that this is the Word of God? Are we really believing that this is the Word of God? When we look down 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and someone put chisel to stone, ink to paper, pen to paper, quill to hide, whatever terminology you want to put on it, those words were scribed down and captured for all eternity. And they were passed down and kept perfect for generations and generations and generations, right? There was never anything wrong with the Word of God ever. Wrong. Don't let me lose you right there. Don't, don't, don't pull back like that. I felt the wind just leave the room when I said that. Don't leave me. Stay with me. All right? We're going somewhere. Now we know that God preserved His Word. We have looked over that. We've seen that in the Word of God, how God's Word is preserved. But friend, don't be mistaken that from the very beginning when God first spoke those words over in Genesis and creation happened, 
Don't think for one minute that back when Adam and Eve were there and Satan came to Eve and said, Thou shalt not surely die. From that point forward, Satan has had a plan for the Word of God to take the Word of God and instead of having a period there, to make it a question mark. Now, just changing the punctuation, the way that he worded that to Eve, was enough of a translational change to get her to believe that she would not surely die and take of that fruit. Say, Brother Tim, what are you talking about, friend? That was the first translation of the Word of God. That was the first translation of the Word of God that was uh, promoted in error to get someone who loved God to do something that God did not want them to do. Eve took of the fruit of that tree based on a translation, thou shalt not surely die, instead of thou shalt surely die. You see the difference in the inflection of my voice there. One is a question, one's a statement. Well, if God said it, it was a statement. Thou shalt surely die. But I think the way Satan kind of put it to Eve is, thou shalt not surely die. That was just enough to get her to take of that fruit. When we look at the Word of God, now let me preface this by saying if you use something other than a King James Version Bible, I'm not mad at you. I do not hate you. I do not think you're a lesser Christian. I'm not going to be mad at you unless you come up to me after church and try to tell me how yours is better than the Word of God. And I'm still not going to be mad at you. I'm still not going to hate you. I'm just going to tell you you're wrong, and then I'll go home. <laughs> but tonight, I'm going to point out why. Over the past few weeks, our pastor has been preaching out of the book of Colossians about what we do as Christians after we're saved, about the home life, the wife's role, the husband's role, the father's role, the children's role, just as a Christian overall. But how can we take what our pastor is preaching every Sunday and apply it to our life if we don't truly believe that what he's saying came from the Word of God? Kind of makes it hard to do that, doesn't it, Brother Dylan? Makes it hard to take that and make it applicable to our lives if we don't really believe that that's God's Word. So tonight, just for a little bit, I've got a few minutes here. So I'm going to give you some comparisons on the Word of God. And yes, I cleared this with our pastor before I'd done it. You ready back there, Charlie? Charlie was kind of, he wasn't crazy about this idea. The first thing I want to look at, you say, well, Brother Tim, you know, I, I mean, I, I read out of the NIV or the New American Standard or you know, the new King James. It's close. It's just updated verbiage, right? I mean, it's no harm, no foul. It's just, they updated the language, right? That's all they done. That, I mean, surely somebody wouldn't take the Word of God and just destroy it on purpose, would they? I don't know. After we look at this, you tell me what you think. Because I'm going to say this. There are many translations of the Bible available. Many, 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 many. And I'm sure you could pick one that would suit your fancy and whatever you want. But I'm going to step over here and I'm going to side with God and I'm going to say this is God's Word. And the others are translations of God's Word. The biggest difference between the King James Bible and all the others is I can go to Staples tonight and I could say, I want 10,000 copies of this. I'd have to pay for the paper and the ink. And I could walk out with 10,000 copies of the King James Bible. If I walked in there with an NIV, New American Standard, New Living Translation, whatever else it is out there, and I wanted 10,000 copies, I would get charged with copyright fees. First statement I want to make tonight about the Word of God is two things that are different cannot be the same. 
If they're different, they can't be the same. The first thing I want to look at is, is this right here. It's not just simple words that were changed in these translations. There were some major doctrinal things that were affected in a major way in these translations. Some that are quite humorous, others that are just downright despicable. Brother Charlie, put the first one up there. The virgin birth. Now the NIV says, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. It's not too bad, is it? It's kind of close, right? But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. Now was it, was that her second son, third son, fourth child, second marriage? Where are we at with this thing? It doesn't really specify, does it? You say, well, let's look at the King James. And he knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son. That whole thing about Mary being a virgin friend is important. <laughs> That's a major doctrinal thing that it just kind of skipped over there in the NIV. And she just gave birth to a son. My wife gave birth to a son. What does that mean? Didn't you give birth to a boy? A couple of them? Yeah. Well, that's, that's pretty spectacular according to the NIV. That you gave birth to a son. It's different, friend. Things that are different can't be the same. Charlie, go to the next one. How about the doctrine of repentance? Matthew 9, 13, the NIV says... But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call the righteous, or I have come, uh, I, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Well, they conveniently left off that whole thing about repentance there at the end. Because repentance means you've got to change your mind. You've got to change your mind. You've got to change your direction from where you was to what you are to where you need to go. And yet, well, the translation there in the NIV just kind of skims over that whole repentance thing because that would kind of mean that, well, man is wrong and we just can't have that. Because I'll be honest with you, friend, they tried to translate this whole thing about humanism right into it. Charlie, you ready for the next one? Number three, how about salvation is affected? Look at what the NIV says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 11. Charlie, where's that verse at? It's exactly right. See, that verse ain't even in the NIV. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. How are you going to take that out of the Bible? I mean... Does anyone have a suggestion there of, of why that one would be gone? How, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost, and yet we're not going to put that in the Bible. Well, that makes perfect sense. Just leave that one out altogether. All right, how about the next one, Brother Charlie? The, the eternity of hell, the duration of hell. The NIV says, and if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. How about where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched part? Or the fire that shall never be quenched. That whole duration of hell thing, they just kind of left that off. So hell has just kind of lost its meaning there because it can just be a temporal thing, right? I mean, in, as far as the NIV is concerned, the, the couple of times that it does mention hell, that it's just it's not even eternity. It's just... I mean, we've all had a couple of bad days here and there, right? And I mean, what was the first thing that went through your mind? <laughs> Man, I'm going through it. It was temporary. I mean, it passed, right? Yeah, so that whole duration of hell thing, man, I, I mean, I guess if you're lost, 
Yeah, read the NIV. It'll make you feel better about it. Uh, next one, Brother Charlie, go to number five. How about none is good? Look at what the NIV says in Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest of heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Yeah. How about glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill towards man? Isn't that what the Messiah was bringing? I mean, it, it wasn't just about the one on who his favor rests, was it? Wasn't it to everyone that he was just... Yeah, I, I kind of think they missed on that one. And how about God is the father of Jesus? In Luke chapter 2, verse 33, the NIV says the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Did y'all catch that? The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Pop quiz. Who was Jesus' father? <laughs> Who was that? Yeah. Hmm. And yet Jesus' father and mother marvel at what was said about him. But see, the, the King James Version has it right because it says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoke of him. Do you notice the difference? However subtle they might be, our pastor brought one up uh, Wednesday, last Wednesday about Philippians 4.13 and just that small word change and how it changes the entire doctrinal meaning of that verse of Scripture. Friend, we've got to get our perception of the Word of God right. Go to the next one, Brother Charlie. The sinless Christ. John chapter 7, verse 8, the NIV says, you will go to the, or you go to the festival. I'm not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. The very next verse has Jesus at the festival. Now, I'm not a biblical scholar by any stretch of the imagination, nor a grammar teacher. But he said, I'm not going up to this festival. So either he lied there, because the very next verse in the Bible has him at the festival. So did Jesus, is he a liar? Because the Jesus I know is sinless. And if he lied there and said he wasn't going to the festival and in the very next verse he was at the festival, then he just told a lie. So are the translators of the NIV saying that now Jesus is a liar, which basically negates everything in the whole Bible from right there? Because if he's just a, a, another lying man, right, preacher? I mean, how, how can we trust him for anything else if he lies about going to a festival? Is that accurate? So go ye up unto the feast, I go not up yet unto this feast. So again, the King James Bible has it correct. Go to the next one. Baptize, or, or baptism after faith. Look at what the NIV says in Acts chapter 8 verse 37. That's some pretty interesting stuff. Um... I think that's, when you look at what the King James Bible has, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, Brother Dylan, that seems pretty legit, right? And yet it was just left completely out. Not even worthy of putting in there. Kind of blew my mind. Go to the next one, Brother Charlie, number nine. The change after salvation. How about this? The NIV says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That sounds great. That sounds wonderful. I love that. Don't that sound good, Miss Candace? Sounds great. I mean, that's really, it's, it's, it's okay. But then if you look at what King James Version says, it says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. See, we try to throw these things out, and, and this is, this is <laughs> if we look at where the church is as a whole, and we start to understand that through, I mean, just so many generations of generations of generations of 
Christians reading a Bible that's not really the Word of God. No wonder we've gotten so messed up as a church. Nobody knows what to believe. Kim and I went and visited a church, and friend, I'm telling you, I mean, it depended on the preacher got preaching. He was out of one version of the Bible, and everybody had their own version. I mean, to the point where they had three different verses up on the screen of the same chapter and text out of the Bible because there's three different versions of the Bible. And he just wanted to make sure he covered everybody who might have something. I mean, you talk about some confusion, friend. Why can't we just accept that the King James Bible is the Word of God and run with it? And I'll tell you why. Because it offends the flesh. That's why we have decided over the years, and I say we as a church have decided to take the Word of God and alter it and change it and make it something that fits what our flesh desires. It's all right. Y'all don't have to be my friend. I got a dog at home and she loves me. All right, Brother Charlie. We only got a couple more and I'm going to make a run for the truck. Number 10, salvation is through Christ. Galatians 4, 7 and IV says, So you are no longer a slave, but God's child, and since you are His child, God has made you also an heir. How did He do that? How did God make you an heir? Well, if we look down at what the King James Version has, Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a a son, and if a son, then an heir of God. Oh, through Christ. That one was conveniently left out in that other translation. And it's not just the NIV. It's multiple (laughs) translations don't have that. So whereas Satan's translation of Eve was just a small little thing to make her doubt, so too, I think that these translators over the years, Brother Dylan, have taken the Word of God and they've taken it and just enough to make a Christian have some doubt. We don't tell them it ain't true. That would just be going too far. Man, friend, you don't think for one second that Satan himself don't want you doubting what the Word of God is? But Tim, you don't understand. That King James Bible, man, I try to read it and I just can't understand it. These these and thous and those. and I mean, it's just too much. And I just, I can't get it. I can't understand it. Friend, it ain't that hard. I promise you it ain't. It ain't that. De- I mean, I'm not a smart man. I'm kind of like Forrest Gump. I ain't a smart man. But, I mean, I can, I can get it sometimes. Sometimes I've got to read it more than once or twice or seven times. But I eventually, it, it sinks in. And you know what? If I pray about it, it kind of works even better. But rather than taking a man where the Word of God says that it's not a private interpretation, but then you've got translators who have taken the Word of God and turned it into a private translation, it's kind of... uh, Let's move on. Number 11, Brother Charlie. How about creation? Ephesians 3, 9 and make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. That's pretty cool. I mean, they kind of, they nailed that one. They got that one dead on, except for that last part, where the Bible actually says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things, by Jesus Christ. Man, it's awesome what those three words add. But if it's okay to take Jesus out of that verse, why not just take him out of the whole thing? Because isn't that whole thing just offensive anyway? And we live now in the age where you can't even buy crackers at the store because they're called crackers. I mean, so if that's... If, if by Jesus Christ can't even be on Ephesians 3, 9, why have it anywhere else? I mean, if you're going to take it out of one, just snub it out with, I mean, hit the backspace on the keyboard, bro. Just go ahead and take him out of all of it. Just control F, Jesus, enter, delete all. I mean, just 
If you're going to do it, just do it. But see, this is subtle. This is the subtlety that Satan uses to deceive people. And what this does is not only the creation, but it takes away from the eternity that Jesus was part of the Trinity and the Godhead because they don't want to promote that either. Oh, man, I'm going to have to take, I don't know, I'm going to have to go take some medicine. All right. John 1, uh, I just kind of got this down here as a reference on that whole creation thing because John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word, or uh, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Basically, that means there's a, a trinity and Jesus was there with God in the beginning. So, that whole, that's there. All right, Charlie, number 12. Christ who? This is the same one that Brother Lee brought up. I'm not going to go back and rehash this one again. If you were here last Wednesday, he done a great job of explaining it. I'm not even going to try to follow that one up because he done it better than I could. Number 13, Brother Charlie. How about the blood just being taken out? This is a good one. Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. How do we get that redemption? Well, the Bible actually says, in whom we have redemption through His blood. And yet, that one wasn't important enough to leave in. They just decided to take that one out too. How about the quality of life? I like this one. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 19. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. It made perfect sense, didn't it? Let's read that again. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. How about they may lay hold on eternal life? What happened to eternal life? I mean, you know, laying hold of the life that is truly life, the life worth living is life and life. I don't even know what they're trying to say there. It was cute, but cute don't get you Bible. All right, Brother Charlie, we're almost done. You going to run with me? All right, number 15, the Trinity. John 5, verses 7 and 8. For there are three that testify. Look at what the NIV says those three are. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. Agreement of what? I'm not real sure. The Bible actually says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Who is the Word? That would be that Jesus guy that they removed earlier. Kind of wonder why they took him out here. And these three are one. So they just, the NIV translators just totally left the whole Trinity out of this verse. It just didn't even matter. And there are three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree in one. Go to the next one, Charlie. We're running out of time. Now, this one was... This one was almost laughable. You know you got some bad stuff, friend. I mean, you know you got some bad papers. Brother Dylan, look at that first line. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. The other three angels. What was the other one? An eagle? I wonder if they had some bad manuscripts. Just guessing. 
maybe there was a reason those manuscripts were found in the trash and half burned before they pulled them out and tried to translate a Bible out of them. I'm just speculating here. But maybe there was a problem when the scribes said, wait a minute, this, this word, that, that's not right. That says eagle. That's, that's supposed to be angel. That one's got to go in the trash. We need to start over. Yeah, I th yeah, that, that one made me laugh. I'm not even going to lie. That one made me laugh. It's disgusting, but it's so disgusting it's almost laughable. All right, Brother Charlie, go to the next one. The angel is out. We're going to go to this next one right here, only two more. How about before the throne? The NIV says no lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. The Bible actually says that for they are without fault before the throne of God. Last but not least, hit that last one, Brother Charlie. And then the doctrine of the judgment. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which was the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. It sounds kind of close, don't it? If we were throwing horseshoes or we were playing cornhole, it'd be a point. The Bible actually says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. You can stand anywhere. But friend, I'm going to tell you, on that judgment day, you're going to stand before God. It's not going to be at your mama's house or at mama's house or at daddy's house or at auntie's house. It's, it's not going to be in front of the preacher, friend. The Bible has it correct here. It says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Friend, you and I are going to stand before God and give an account for what we've done, what we do, what we've said, what we think. And for some of us, that's going to be very, uh, just a disastrous day. And I've got news for you. I believe the, the men and women that are responsible for translating some of these things into some of the garbage that we've seen here tonight. They're going to have to answer for it. And again, if you read one of these, hey, I'm not mad at you. You've been deceived. You have been deceived, friend, if you're reading anything other than the authorized King James Version. You say, well, Brother Tim, don't you know that King James was a heathen? How could God use a man like King James to translate the Bible from the original Greek and Hebrew manuscripts into the Bible that we have today? Friend, like I told my pastor earlier today, I said, read Hebrews chapter 11 and you'll find out what kind of people God uses to do his work. He used a drunk, murderer, harlot, and I mean, you can go down through the list. And friend, guess what? He uses you too. Look at your past. Look at your present. God uses me. Look at my past. Look at my present. And yet God still uses people to accomplish his will. Now, here's the thing. You say, Brother Tim, do you truly believe that that is the real Word of God, the true Word of God? Yes, I do. Unapologetically, I will not apologize. I'm not sorry about it. I do believe it. I believe this is the perfect Word of God. It's complete. It's whole. It's everything that I need. Nothing more, nothing less. Can I live it all? Absolutely not. Do I believe it all? Absolutely do. I'm not perfect, but the Word of God is. Tim, how can you be so sure? I look at it like this, and I'm going to come to a close. I'm going to answer that question with a question. I'm assuming everyone here tonight believes that there's a God in heaven. And that God is the God. All-knowing, all-powerful. Omniscient, omnipresent, whole nine. Right? We agree on that? And yet you don't think God's smart enough to know that Greek and Hebrew was going to fall by the way of the dodo bird and that English was going to be the predominant language spoken throughout this entire globe. 
and that God knew his words would have to be taken out of Greek and Hebrew that were dying languages and put into a language that everyone knew because, hey friend, every, every, every pilot in the world has to speak English. You cannot be a pilot unless you can speak English because every control tower in the entire world speaks English. English is the predominant language, and yet you want me to believe that God didn't know that His inspired, infallible, perfect Word needed to be preserved in an English language because everyone on the planet, the predominant language is English. And yet somehow God couldn't see that coming. Yes, friend, I believe that King James Bible is the Word of God. I believe it with all my heart. If I'm wrong, eh, you can sue me after I'm dead. I ain't hurting nobody by believing it, right? But if I believe that there's an eagle flying in heaven around the throne of God and the eagle is speaking, whoa, 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 well... If I take Jesus out of it, if I take the blood out of it, if I remove the Trinity and I remove creation, I remove the virgin birth, what other things are we going to remove from the Word of God and be okay with? How much are you okay with being taken out of the Word of God? How much are you comfortable with giving up out of the Word of God and you still be okay with that and you calling that the Word of God? I'm going to end with this. Now, I heard this a long time ago, and I, I still use it pretty regular, and I still like it. Uh, Tanner's girlfriend come over at the house, and uh, she made the world's best banana muffins. I literally almost fell on my knees eating this thing. I'm talking about it was so moist and so delicious, and had chunks of bananas in it, and it had like this crust of brown sugar on the top of it. I mean, so when you bit the muffin, it was all moist on the inside, and just it just kind of melted, but then, Brother Dylan, there was this crunch of like this brown sugar coat. I, mm, it was so good. And that's like the Word of God. But what if she said, you know, I'm going to make another batch, but only put a little bit of dog poop in it? Would you still eat it? Well, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even touch them. I've had what was good. But it's just a little bit, like just a teaspoon of dog poop in the whole recipe. It made a dozen muffins. So in the whole dozen muffins, we're just going to split up a, a teaspoon of dog poop. It's kind of what's happened with these translations of the Bible. They didn't back up a tandem dump truck and beep, 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 and just dumped a whole load of manure on it. It's a little here and a little there and a little there. My question is, how much of the Word of God are you willing to sacrifice in your life? Remember, we're talking about your perception of the Word of God. Friend, if you're going to believe anything that's preached out of the Word of God, you need to make sure you've got the right Word of God. So my question is, what is your perception of the Word of God and how much are you willing to sacrifice on the Word of God and still accept it? I'm not willing to sacrifice on the Word of God. There are some things I'm willing to sacrifice on. But this is a hill also I'm willing to die on. I'm not going to give up my King James Bible. I'm just not going to do it. And if you use something other than a King James Bible, I pray, I pray that you'd consider asking God what you should do about that. I'm not going to, I don't think any less of you as a Christian if you do. I ain't mad at you if you do. It's not going to affect me if you do. But it is affecting you. And it's going to have a negative effect on you. Preacher, you got anything you want to say tonight? All right, well, I guess we're going to wrap this thing up. I've kept everybody long enough. I've made enough enemies. So, uh...
<laughs> All right. We're just going to go ahead and close out there. But remember this. You, yes. And what, what is that? Oh, the... Talk about Mark Trotter's claim? Yeah. Oh.